Yeah, and the, the great thing about this is that work from anywhere is available to anybody that can do their work while they're mobile because you've got all this connection and it's so wonderful. But what's disruptive about it? How is it changing telco? This right here, this call that we're on right here, I think is the largest disruptor. So um, just to kind of step back a little bit, you know, Avaya most recently just raised their hand and said, hey, we're going to wave the white flag and we're kind of done developing the cloud ourselves. We're going to use our friends over at Ring Central and move our cloud customers to Ring Central. They call it ACO, by cloud office. So that's a pretty big disruptor going over to what I'll call traditional hosted VoIP. This is um, this isn't traditional hosted voice in my mind anyway. I'd be interested, Doug and Dave, to get your opinion on this. But traditional hosted voice, Dave, is what you and I were doing: dropping a Polycom phone on someone's desk, and you got broad software or the likes in the background. That's what I'm calling traditional. So, Avaya moving to traditional hosted voice. I think that's the next five years or so. But this stuff is really taking hold here. This is um, what I'm going to say is non-traditional in my mind you send out a WebRTC link of some sort and we just click on it and we can not only communicate verbally, also video and screen share and everything else that goes along with it, which is pretty wild. And that call is free, right? Because you've got internet there where you are, Doug's got internet, I've got internet here at the Marriott. So at the end of the day, we're riding over an existing internet service that we're, we're utilizing for whatever. But this communication right here essentially is free. You might be paying for a seat on one of these platforms, but the, I'm talking about the transmission. There's no PSTN, there's no origination and termination costs and cost per minute. Oh, you know, how much time do we have here? You know, what, what kind of bill have we racked up, right? We don't have to yeah. worry about that stuff anymore. Remember the days and you have a relative in the background, this is a long distance call, hurry up, yeah. get here, <laughs> yeah. right? Remember those days, Doug? Well, actually, I, I think if your family was like mine, uh, there was a there was a code. So when you when you arrived in Pittsburgh safely, you you rang once and then hung up, and then you rang again or something like that, and then they knew you were there. So there were all these schemes, and you know, um, here in I I didn't know such a thing existed growing up in Toronto, but when I uh, when I went to college in Oregon. I started encountering in the early 80s, I, like you, I, I, I was in college in the 80s. And in the, at, it, it, right into the 70s, there were people in Portland, Oregon, who had uh, fa family lines. Uh, you know, their household was sharing, I thought that was sort of like a rural phenomenon. But yeah. In, it was a suburban thing in Portland. Um, people, um, you know, four or five people in a family were sharing that l one phone line with three or four other households. And, uh, you know, I, th I thought that was something that, you know, you'd find in East Germany or something like that, not, not you know, in, in the most advanced place in the world. So, you know, the, 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 the revolution in telecommunications, in communications, and to your point, in basically almost freemium communications, right, is, a f is just a phenomenon that we've kind of lived through and we've kind of accepted. Um, there was a fellow named Harry Newton. That was a that was sort of a big deal when when you and I were both starting out, and he kind of famously said when this started to show up, that the distance has been taken out of long distance. So yeah. in other words, basically now, all communications, and I think he called this sometime in the very early '90s, uh, even before VoIP really came on the scene. He said basically, it we're, we're, where we're going is all all calls, all sessions, all communications will be local effectively so it's almost as if basically we're all inside that hotel that you're staying at and we're just having an electronic conference without you know even leaving the building the quality is excellent and by the way you know uh, notwithstanding issues that do do show up were you in london were you in in johannesburg south africa probably the quality of this session would be about the same Exactly, it's wild. And didn't didn't Newton do that Newton Telecom dictionary with all the yeah. acronyms? That's right. Yeah, thought. yeah, yeah. He had Teleconnect magazine. He had uh, Newton's t Telecom dictionary. Yeah. And he used to have a conference every year. Um, and then you know we can talk about this as a sort of side phenomenon of of the cycles that we've lived through, of of a, a timing and good timing on how to sell a business. He sold uh, Teleconnect magazine right before. The first tele, the first IT crash basically right after 2000, did very well. 
they got out just at the right time. My history goes back to right after deregulation, there was also a phenomenon. It was exciting. There was a used equipment market. You could buy used Nortel cards that went inside a PBX. It was a huge thing. So we actually started a publication originally to serve just that market, to go to enterprise end users, telling the story of all these guys that were basically selling used equipment. That's basically how, by the way, I came into the CCA eventually because I met Joe Marion through that process. Joe goes back, Joe, I think actually was part of that world. Um, and then he, he became the director of, of, of something called the NATD. And this was maybe like 91, 92 or something like that. It's some time ago. Um, but you know, within a decade already, there was transition going on. The software had become a bigger part of the advertising in our publication versus hardware. And soon after that, of course, VoIP and then cloud-based services. Um, I think I, I, there, was, there were some people already selling subscription-based services. They weren't calling a cloud that, that actually emerged fairly soon. I would say right, right in the early O's, basically, there were already people who kind of saw it and they weren't maybe even articulating the word cloud, but they were sort of actually adopting that model. Um, there were E911 guys that were starting to do that and so on. So 